I was on the phone with a 13 year old last night who had something really scary happen to him yesterday afternoon and his dad was at work. Um, his stepmom was, was seemed like she was mad at him. And he told me this whole story of something that he had gone on. And I, I said, thanks for sharing. I said something like, do you want to keep talking about it? Or do you want some advice? And he said, no, I just, you know, I wanted to have, it's just nice to have somebody to talk to that I could trust. And for him to say that out loud, that matters, right? And so for him, years from now, he knows to have somebody I can trust to talk to will make a big difference. Welcome to the Don't Change Much podcast. I am your host, Dan Murphy. And our guest today is Jonathan Reed from Next Gen Men. Next Gen Men is a nonprofit organization with an ambitious goal to build a future where boys and men experience less pain. As director of programs, Jonathan is an educator, a researcher, and an advocate who guides conversations with youth in classrooms and wilderness expeditions alike. He's passionate about supporting boys' well-being and challenging gender-based violence, where boys themselves are often the first victims. It's frontline work that emphasizes boys aren't broken and men aren't toxic. It takes strength to knock someone down, just as it does to lift them up. Jonathan, uh, we're so pleased you could join us today to talk about your expertise in uh, a very interesting field for uh, a lot of people, a lot of young men, a lot of uh, older men like myself. Uh, but I just want to ask you first off, uh, what is Next Gen Men? <laughs> Thanks for having me in the, let me answer the question. The name is about the next generation. And so when we talk about Next Gen Men, we're talking the heart and soul of what we do is about supporting boys while being in, and helping them challenge gender-based violence and chart new paths forward for themselves. The organization, Next Gen Men, is a Canadian organization um, focused on engaging boys and men in conversations like gender norms, mental health, healthy relationships, gender equality, and what all those things mean both to ourselves and to the people around us. We work in workplaces and sports teams, in the boardroom and on the streets. But what I specifically do as director of programs with the organization, and sort of my background is in education. I started out as a teacher, but my passion is here, is in this work being done by Next Gen Men. So my focus is on those boys, those young men themselves, as well as providing trainings and resources for the adults who are already deep in connection with them. So parents, coaches, teachers, and that kind of thing to work together to nurture boys into becoming their best selves. What inspired or, or motivated you to take on a role such as this? So, first of all, no disrespect to teachers. I, I know countless teachers and have so much respect for the work that they do. And I'll just say, like, when I was studying to become a teacher, I could just sense I'm not sparked. I'm not passionate about math curriculums in the way that I am when I think about challenging gender-based violence. And when I look back on where that passion came from for me, it's, I guess, to be a little vulnerable in sharing that it has to do with an identity uh, for me as a survivor. In that when I was a young kid, I had long blonde hair and I was really small. And I did things like dance and uh, I did cheerleading. And so I got, I faced homophobic bullying every single day in middle school. And I'm not unaware of the fact that not every kid who faces that level of cruelty from their peers makes it through. And so when I was an older teenager, I heard about Ronan Shu. This is years ago, and I still remember his name, Ronan Shimizu, who died at age 12. And he was on the cheerleading team. And when I was age 12, I was on the cheerleading team. And so I had this sense of survivorship there that then resurfaced again in the midst of the Me Too movement, being the survivor of physical violence or sexual violence myself. And then lastly, as I got more into the work of supporting young people who are struggling, I've also been the, the survivor of some young people who have taken their lives. And so I carry their stories and their memories and I still think about them like more often than they ever thought that I would, right? So there's just this thread of being a survivor it's through my life that then has meant, this is going to sound a little dramatic, but I'm like, this is the most important thing we could be talking about. To me, I really deeply feel that. And so with all the love for educators and teachers, that's why I'm like, math curriculum is not where my heart is. 
I'm thinking as deeply and as, as, as like carefully as I can about how to support boys, protect them, help them be true to themselves and cared for by the people around them because I know firsthand how much that matters. First off, thank you for, for sharing that. And this is the old person in me. I mean, I think when most people my age hear gender-based uh-huh. violence, they automatically think of females, women being the targets. Uh, so could you maybe define that for us, gender-based violence? What does yeah. it mean? Yeah, like I'll say for myself, some boys or some men listening to this could also think for themselves. Like we've all experienced, oh, hey, boys all cry. Rub some dirt in it, walk it off. Or I often tell people, this is, again, just maybe potentially a little bit blunt, but like I'll tell people I learned the word fag because I got told that's what I was. We also know, of course, that one in three women in Canada experience physical sexual violence. We know that whether it's verbal or physical, that there's all kinds of ways that violence is enacted upon people of other genders. But I guess when I think about gender balance, I'm like, it's not one or the other. It is all of these different layers of experiences that often create patterns. And so, for example, there's research that points to the fact that the middle schoolers who engage in homophobic name calling are also longitudinally, like years later, those are the young men who are engaged in physical sexual violence towards women. Like that's the same structure. It's the same pattern. And that's what I would call gender-based violence. And so I definitely wouldn't want men just to think about gender-based violence as something that happens to women that's perpetrated by men. And we at Next Gen Men focus on the fact that whether you want to call it patriarchy or toxic masculinity or gender-based violence, that that impacts boys and men ourselves in terms of our own, our self-esteem, our sense of ourself, as well as our connections with others. And both of those things, I think, are examples of what, what has the potential to be, it's not inherently, but has the potential to be gender-based violence. Okay, so I, I'm 54 and I do remember in high school where perhaps we weren't aware how much impact our words carried. And certainly as you go, as you grow older, you realize the, the, the effects and the harm these words can cause. But I, I still really don't remember this topic being brought to the forefront, being so forward facing until, I don't know, a decade ago, perhaps like when did this really become a talking part? When did we realize that this was affecting a lot more of the population than perhaps we originally would have thought? I think people would be surprised to know about how long this work has been done. This is not new. It's not a new conversation. And even the phrase toxic masculinity goes back to the eighties or something like that. This isn't actually as new as we might think. In some ways, like we're standing on the shoulders of giants of whether it's like grassroots men just in their own communities or like seminal researchers who paved the way. We benefit from the waves of feminism and men's engagement in feminism that have preceded us. Can you not wrong? Nobody was talking about, like, I'm the same as you, right? I'm just in my late 20s and nobody was talking about this kind of thing when I was growing up either. And part of the reason that I faced so much homophobic bullying was because my teachers were resourceless. They had no clue what to do about that. I'm sure they were aware. I wasn't invisible in what I was experiencing, but they had no clue what to do and there was no conversation happening whatsoever. And so there is a kind of a compelling question. Okay, so we are talking about it now and we weren't even 15 years ago. So to answer that, I'd say it's just been growing quietly in, in different contexts, just being led by different champions within even like small sports teams or small school communities. And probably the time that it really started to be a hashtag would have been in the midst of that Me Too movement. And that was a few years after Next Gen Men started, right? So, and Next Gen Men was inspired by another organization, called, another program called Wise Guys that had been going on for several years. So it's not that it started in the Me Too movement, but I think in that sort of 2017 window of time, there was a rise in public consciousness of the importance of engaging boys and men in these kinds of topics. I always remember the phrase when we were younger, oh, boys yeah. will be boys, but I mean, obviously it causes... Uh, tremendous amount of damage and it's just a throwaway line from a parent or uh, a guardian or someone. Um, What is the man box? So yeah, so when we talk about programming, there's a lot of ways that we like approach that conversation. And one of the simplest 
is this idea of the man box. So in order to like really get at a conversation that was approachable, as accessible to as many people as possible, the man box is a really helpful conceptualization of the gender norms and stereotypes that are faced by boys and men, the pressures and expectations that we face, because that's what it means to be a boy or be a man. And so this goes back decades. It originated with Paul Kivel. It's been definitely picked up and refined by uh, Tony Porter, but it's common in lots of different places within the work of, of engaging boys and men. And so the idea is, is we, we all experience this rigid box that tells you who you are and who you can't be. And inside the box are these like stereotypical notions of masculinity. So to be tough, to be aggressive, dominant, confident, to have huge muscles, like those are all within the man box and outside the box is stereotypical things that would not be allowed for boys. And like I described, I know this first, hey, you can't have long hair. You can't be involved in dance or cheerleading or cry or wear makeup. Because if you do, the two of us know the kinds of words that you'll get called. The idea is, you know, as boys, we get forced into that box and we get told compress or cut off those parts of yourself that don't fit. And the stereotypes just roll off boys' tongues. Even 10-year-olds know just as well as you and I what those stereotypes look like. And I often point out to them, it's really interesting, right? None of us are surprised. And you're like, well, duh. But actually, that is interesting because nobody ever gave you a book. Like, I'll explain to, like, grade 7 and grade 8 boys. No one ever sat you down or you never had a class explaining this is what it means to be a man. And, you know, we all still know. So then we talk about where do these messages and narratives, where do we see these representations? Like, where does all of that come from? And we'll talk about it's our parents, it's our peers, it's social media, it's commercials and billboards. Like, it's all around us that we see these representations and these, we experience these constraints so this boundary of what it means to be a man. And then we'll often do some kind of experiential activity because <laughs> that's part of the work of engaging boys is right, figuring out how to actually, how do we keep them active and engaged and all that kind of thing. And, and so the one of the, my, my favorite experiential activities with the man box is comes from outdoor education. And, uh, and uh, it basically you stand on a mat, everybody has to fit on the mat, and then the mat gets folded in half and folded in half and folded in half. And at some point, not everybody fits, right? Or not every part of every person fits. And that leads to a conversation about what does it cost us to constantly have to be engaged in this system where you're either in or you're out, or you're doing it wrong. So how, how do you begin a conversation with a, a boy or a young man who says, I don't feel like I fit in to this man box. I don't feel like some of these are my values. I don't feel like this is who I am. How do you start that conversation uh, to say there is no real defined box of how to be a man. There's a book called Cracking the Boy Code where the writer Adam Cox points out, he worked with a lot, he's a psychologist, I think, and and he says something like, I've worked with a lot of boys who are really disinterested in talking, but pretty much all boys seem to be kind of interested in themselves. And so I think that like, first of all, it's just like sort of developmentally appropriate. And everybody's kind of interested in themselves, just sharing about themselves. But kind of what I took from that is if we start from like boys' own experiences and boys' own beliefs, there's first of all familiarity there. And there's also something interesting for boys to be exploring for themselves what they think, what they believe, and what they've experienced. And so rather than starting hypothetical or starting with like societal level statistics, like we'll often start on that personal lived experience of what do you think about this? How have you experienced that? And that gives boys and young men a bit of an entry point into the conversation then it is kind of tough right because all stereotypes come from some kernel of truth maybe not all but a lot of stereotypes come from some kernel of truth and boys are often like pretty open but also mildly confused right okay if i'm supposed to be a man which means to be tough and to be dominant and be aggressive i'm also not supposed to be toxic right so i do know to i need to be respectful and listen, and then, and so on and so on. There's a lot of pressure and there's a lot at stake right now. And it's kind of confusing in a lot of ways. And all that being said, on the flip side, to then just say to boys, be whatever you want. There are no rules. 
it's freeing, it's liberating, but it's also kind of overwhelming. It's navigating a, like a wide open horizon with no math, which is pretty tough. And so if we go back to that principle of starting with boys, familiarity or interest in themselves, one of the ways that we like approach positive masculinity and nurturing positive masculinity is to say the qualities themselves of, let's say, toughness or strength. That's one of the ego choose. The, the quality itself of strength is not harmful or positive. It's not toxic or good. Like there's nothing. It's just strength. And that being said, if you know as a young man you want to prove yourself to be strong, you can do that in all kinds of ways. Like it does take strength to dominate somebody else, to knock them into the dirt. That takes strength. It's true. It also takes strength to lift somebody up and to hold them. That takes strength as well. And so what we'll often do when we start talking about, okay, what, what does positive masculinity mean to you? is give boys a whole bunch of options. And some of them are well within the stereotype. There's strength, confidence, determination. And some of them are way outside of the, the stereotype. There's gentleness and sensitivity and, and being loving. And so we'll offer boys all of these different qualities that are represented in a, a card deck that my colleague Adrian and I made called Boys Will Be Blank. And then we'll engage them in sort of reflection on what does it look like to put these qualities that you care about into practice for yourself as a young man. I don't know if that answered your question, but that's just a gleam that, you know, yes. I have so of what it looks like to approach that conversation. I mean, it sounds like it's, it's just as important to have the conversations with the kids that feel like they fit in that box as the boys that feel like they don't fit in that yeah, box. Yeah, totally. And I'd say for the boys who, like, well, for, really for anybody, like part of also part of the puzzle, and especially when talking about mental health like part of the puzzle is to figure out where is the familiar territory that we can sort of take those first few steps together so for example um back in like 2019 when i was first facilitating in, in regular programs in schools every single this is putting it a little bit dramatically but every single boy in the greater toronto area knew exactly what had happened in the 2018 nba finals in the basketball finals in the nba and to make a long story short the I believe the Cleveland Cavaliers got swept. And at the end of the Cleveland Cavaliers losing the entire title, LeBron James, who is their star player, said, I played the entire series with a broken hand. And every single boy knew this. The 13, like every 13-year-old boy could tell me like shot for shot, you know, what had happened. And my question then was, if you're LeBron James, if you're a professional athlete and you're injured, like why do you keep that to yourself? Why don't you tell anybody? Because he didn't, right? He didn't tell me. He didn't tell any, any other teams like that he was injured. And they'll say, I don't want to be taken advantage of. I didn't, I don't want to be the center of attention. I don't want everyone to know that I screwed up and so on and so on. And then from there, the conversation can then be, okay, what about if you're a, say you're a young teenage boy, right? Who's struggling with a mental health challenge or stress or grief or something like that. Why might you keep that to yourself? And the answers are often quite similar. I don't want to be taken advantage of. I don't want to be the center of everyone's attention. I don't want to let people down right? And so on. And what we've done is get to that place, that more vulnerable spot, which is often quite unfamiliar territory, but we walked through an entry point together where boys do feel comfortable. And that's particularly salient for when talking about boys who are what you might call inside the man box or who identify as part of the man, because they think they might think mental health is not for me. You know, I'm, this conversation is not relevant to me. It's not true. Right. Of course, it's not true, but they need some sort of guidance into how to enter into that conversation in a way that feels safe and approachable to them. And I think it's it's more important than ever. I mean, the I think I have the numbers in front of me is the Canadian men's health uh, risk, mental health risk, the uh, depression and anxiety for young men between 19 and 29 is much higher versus the national average, 43 percent versus 18%. Wow. So this is something that's affecting a lot of young men. And do you believe if you can get to them before they hit the age of 17, 18, 19, you can have these valuable discussions. You can perhaps start them on a better path mentally to understand who they are and who they are is okay. These are real, you know, young people who are struggling. And in terms of the I guess the strategy, you know, of primary prevention or of working with younger, younger youth. 
there's a couple of pieces there. Like I often explain to educators, our focal point is that young adolescence, and that's not for no reason. It has to do with the fact that both in research, but also in our firsthand experience, like these young teenagers are really starting to think about themselves as young men, but they haven't totally made up their mind. So they're totally like keyed into the conversation because they're really curious, they're really thoughtful and really open in a lot of ways to what manhood will mean for them. And certainly that lays a foundation for how they'll experience themselves as well as their relationships with others later on in adolescence. And the other piece too that comes to mind for me is that relationship. So there's a researcher named Maybe Way who's done really, really incredible qualitative or relational research with boys on friendship. And one of the things that she noticed is these boys at age 11, age 12, are completely expressive about how much their relationships mean. So they'll say, you know, I couldn't live without my best friend. He's my heart. He's everything. And it's this beautiful, like it's this loving language. They really don't guard any of that. And those same boys five years later are much more guarded and much more, I guess, dismissive of the importance of So the same boy who said, you know, I would lose my mind, like my mental health would tank. I would kill myself if I didn't have my best friend. That same boy five years later is like, no, no, I'm fine. I'm not gay. We hang out, but we don't talk much. And there's this guardedness, dismissiveness, but also like there's, I don't know if this is the right way to put it, but there's a sense of like, I've given up. I got betrayed a couple of times, priorities shifted, and I've lost what I knew was so important to me back then. And so I think if boys experience being held in trusting, authentic relationships, particularly by male role models, but really by anybody, that will help them remain grounded to how much that matters. And we know that relationships are critical for mental health and well-being. And I'll say for myself personally, I was on the phone with a 13-year-old last night who had had something really scary happen to him yesterday afternoon. And his dad was at work. Um, his stepmom was, was seemed like she was mad at him. And he told me this whole story of something that he had gone on. And I, I said, thanks for sharing. And I said, do you want to keep talking about it? Or do you want like, some advice? And he said, no, I just, you know, I wanted to have, it's just nice to have somebody to talk to that I could trust. And for him to say that out loud, now he knows that matters, right? And so for him, years from now, he knows to have somebody I can trust to talk to will make a big difference. And so I think that's like another piece, but I think that makes a big difference for challenging this pattern of the huge numbers of depression and anxiety that are facing young adults. I've got a daughter, so it's a little bit different. But if I had a son, and these are things that I never faced when I was younger, how can, aside from listening, how can you be a positive role model? How can you support someone that's going through these things if you've never experienced Mm -hmm. them yourself? The first, I was like, sure, it's helpful for an adult role model who has experienced something to be like, I've been through something like that before. And my, that's just the encouragement that I made it through or maybe, or maybe it's some more tangible advice on here's what I did. Like there's obviously value to that. And that being said, like, I almost wonder if it's more impactful if you don't know, if you've never experienced that before. And, um, because it forces ourselves as adults to, to hopefully take on a position of curiosity. I don't know what that feels like. I need you to tell me. And or I don't I need you, but like, I'm totally open. I'm curious to know if you'll tell me. And that position of curiosity is really, really important. It's I'll say for myself as someone who works with a lot of young people, hopefully this comes across, but I'm actually getting really keyed into this conversation. It's really easy to get into this mindset of I've seen this before. I know what the answer is. I know what the right thing is to do. And I'm going to tell you. And for example, I had a kid call me who was, he'd been mocking you a locker at school. I've never been locked into a locker before, but I have, as I sort of explained, I face physical bullying. I know what that feels like. And so I'm like, I know what you need to do. Like call your dad, call the school, like bang on the locker. And I started problem solving for him and telling him exactly what to do. And he interrupted me and he swore at me. And he was like, I didn't call you because I needed advice. I know what I have to do. I called you because I wanted someone to talk to. And I, and that for me was like a moment where I had to remind myself, my job here is not to solve problems. My job here is not to 
come up with the answers, but my job here is to listen, right? And to ask questions. And so I think for adults who are, are witnessing boys, like struggling with what does it mean to be a man today? Who are struggling potentially with the pressures and expectations of not just manhood, but also just school or athletics or relationships. One of the most valuable thing we can do is just ask questions and be authentically curious. There's so much to learn from boys and in engaging in genuine conversation. It's not just that there's new possibilities open for them. I think there's new possibilities open for us. Seems like there's a lot of outside forces that make it very difficult. You've talked about social media and society telling these young men who they should be. This is who you need to be. You want to drive the nice car and have the apartment. So young men are going to be on social media. They're going to, they're going to pick up role models they want. They're going to see who they might want to be. How, how do we caution against this aside from cutting all social media off from young men? How disruptive is this to their lives? Or no, it's like really important to be aware of these things. And not that again, not that adults need to have the answers or be totally informed, but especially, but to know enough to ask some questions to a ninth grader. So no, it is a good, it is a good a question or thought. One piece for me is, is for sure just critical media literacy. There are people on the internet who are going to take your money anytime they can. And the, so the critical media literacy is just to look at influencers and think to yourself, what are they getting out of this? What are they trying to get from me? And that's a really important thing for people of any age, of any gender to be thinking about because that marketing, those attempts to, whether it's just gain your attention or gain your wallet, that's, that's powerful. Just thinking twice and thinking critically about what you see online is valuable. All that being said, there is something particularly resonant about some of these guys, like there's David Goggins, there's Myron Gaines, like there's all these guys who are being quite like, I'll just say loud in this re-entrenchment of the status quo of what it means to be a man. And they're popular. And to me, they're kind of popular in the same way that Fortnite is popular, in the same way that the Marvel Cinematic Universe is popular. They're leveraging something in particular about masculinity and what it means to be a man. And that's resonating with young teenage boys. And so when I think about what should we ask or what should we think about or what should we instill in boys is basically an opportunity for them to have their own needs met in that they get a sense of belonging, a sense of independence, a sense of mastery or generosity that like they have these needs met within their existing relationships and they have positive male role models already around them. And that insulates them from the dominance of like David Goggins saying, this is what it means to be a man, stay hard, right? The guys that I climb with, like I climb with a lot of young teenagers at the rock climbing gym in my neighborhood. Like we'll laugh together about the stay hard thing because we all know what it looks like to be athletic and also to be in relationship with each other. And that kind of, mm. it doesn't invalidate David Goggins and I'm sure they still look up to him in some ways, but it gives them an alternative path for what positive masculinity and what athletic, dominant, like confident masculinity might still look like. So positive masculinity, can that be ever shifting and evolving from the age of 14 to 35 as you figure out you know, more and more who you are, what matters to you, your job, your family. Is it something that's constantly Yeah, I think it can be, and I think it should be. And that's like the huge, what, for me, one of the, like the coolest things about the idea of positive masculinity is that it's unique to everybody, that it isn't this prescriptive dominate man box that's being imposed from higher up in the hierarchy, but this like internal, deeply felt explorative sense of yourself. And that's unique to you. And obviously you as a person are going to change from when you're 14 to when you're 30. And so to be aware of that, to be thinking about that and talking about it with the people around you is not just a cool opportunity, but like a really, really like impactful way to grow as a person. For me, for example, I, I would have told you that like independence was really important to me as a young adult. I went to university really young. I traveled abroad and... As the years went by, I realized um, it's not that I actually believe I need to be 
totally tough and do everything on my own because I've actually experienced enough things to know I'm not, I'm not capable of that. I realized independence isn't actually what matters most to me. What matters more than that is resilience, is being able to get back up after I've been knocked down. That's the quality that I really do want to embody. And that changed from, again, say age 16 to age 24. That was like a transformation that I experienced as I navigated the world. Since Next Gen Men started, do you find that things are getting better or are we still on the ground floor? Perhaps we're still on the ground floor and things are getting better. Oh man, I, uh, I hate to tell you this, but I think things are getting worse in some yeah <laughs> there you go and and that's like a that's a dramatic way to put it but like the, the my executive, next gen executive director Nate jake made a joke one time like that and i don't know where he got this but he said why is it called waves of feminism because there's always an undertow and i think something that i've been seeing over the last several years is yeah is this growing push back that no 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 all this wokeness this feminist this relationship mental like it's all bs and, um, and what we need to do is get back to ground zero of what it really means to be a man. And while that's happening, there's other people still charting that path forward. When you want to call it like liberation or stepping away from those man box norms. And so we've actually ended up with this like polarity of some people saying very, very clearly, no, no, no. To be a man means to be strong and be tough and to make money. And other people are saying, you're totally harmful and toxic for saying that. And, and then there's really not any conversation happening whatsoever. I'm seeing, for young men, I'm seeing a lot of confusion, a lot of pressure, really high stakes, worries about wokeness, worries about cancel culture. And um, the one sort of upside to all of this is that the conversation's happening. You and I are sitting down together and talking about this, that hopefully boys are talking to their parents or teenagers are talking to each other. Like the fact that this is a topic that's coming up for people is, is valuable, but like, I don't really, I'm like grounded enough. I'm like seeing the real world enough to know that I'm not going to like shine my trophy on the shelf and be like, we've done it. Yeah. So and good. homophobia is still alive and well in the hallways in schools that boys are still feeling really stuck in how to be who they're meant to be, but also who they want to be. It's tough and the work has got to continue. And the work has got to also not just be by people who are lucky enough for it to be our jobs, but also by the people who are just in the everyday lives of boys, like their parents, their older brother, their coaches for that house league team. They're not recording a podcast on this topic, but it's like more, even more important for them to be thinking about this kind of thing and to be reflecting to boys. Here's what I love about you. Here's the strengths that I see in you. Hey, tell me more about what you think about this David Goggins down here. Hey, tell me more about what you're seeing at school or the kind of man that you want to be. Like those are the conversations. After this, whoever's listening to this podcast, like after the, our conversation's done, those are the conversations that you need to have. You said it's still running rampant in the school hallways. Unfortunately, it still is at the very top of politics as well, which is another discussion. The name of the podcast is Don't Change Much. And I think you've just touched on it a little bit. Uh, in that last answer for people who don't feel right to have skin in the game. So how can you help? How can you be an ally? But to you, when you hear don't change much, what do you think? The first thought, it reminds me of childhood in a bit of a way. I don't know if you remember like the yearbook, have a good summer and never change, like that kind of mentality. And I end up thinking about how much we as young people are told to change by, especially by our peers, especially by the people who don't get us. And so for me, for example, I got told every single day, cut your hair. And you know, what are you, gay? What are you, a girl? And so for me, don't change much means stay true to yourself. Are you going to change? Be open to change, but don't change because some asshole on the playground told you that you have to change. Change because you're ready, change because you're curious, change because you're growing, and don't change much. Fantastic. Thank you very much for the conversation. Yeah, thanks for having me. Well, thank you so much for listening. We want to hear what you think. Rate this episode, share a review, and click the follow button to join us every month on the Don't Change Much podcast. Don't change much.